so as I said, I've only been um, looking at lichens really from last autumn, very much a sort of COVID related project, you might say, uh, from not having too much to do. And uh, this one um, struck me um, after going around the same place a few times because it's quite small and insignificant. And it actually, to me, doesn't look like a lichen at all. And when you look at all the other lichens, it comes out uh, um, quite different. I mean, the first thing that you notice, of course, is it's got this um, raised lip around the edge there. And it's a very simple, straightforward thing. Um, the place where I found it <clears throat> is uh, my local spot, my local patch, which is um, it's a local nature reserve, about 50 acres or so. It's on... Um, relic lowland heath um, on clay with flints which is what's left after um, the chalk um, you know like at Brighton and so forth has all been eroded away over the millennia and just leaves uh, this sort of reddish brown clay with lots and lots of bits of broken up flints in it um, so it doesn't have much fertility and uh, elsewhere farmers tend to enrich it a lot or they just turn it into forestry it's quite near the coast, about five kilometres away, so it's often quite misty. Um, it has very poor drainage, of course, because of the uh, clay and quite thin soil. <clears throat> Along the edge of it, you get all these trees, um, often looking quite stunted. Um, this is uh, what I found. So always uh, this uh, Normandina Pulcella is on here. It seems to be on these uh, small stunted oaks. <clears throat> and usually about uh, eye height, which is quite convenient, between <laughs> half a meter and two meters. Um, <clears throat> in, so as I describe it, seasonally shelled, shaded light woodland and usually quite well sheltered, but getting some sunlight, I think. <clears throat> There's another one. So this was on um, uh, a fairly damp day, so they're quite green looking. When they're, when they're dry, they turn more bluey gray color, um, glaucous color. Um, the size of the thallus or thalli, thalluses or thalli, <clears throat> it's quite difficult to tell because clearly they're sort of half buried in the, uh, the moss, the bryophytes. Um, but looking at the patches, you could say that, you know, from a couple of centimeters here to about 25 centimeters perhaps. Um, so I took some back to have a look in my uh, dissecting microscope, which is basically a digital scope here. And the thallus um, is basically, <clears throat> some people describe each one of these as being um, squamules. And some people say the squamule is the bit underneath and these are the lobes which are on top of it. Um, but more to that later. So they're about three millimeters across they have this sharp raised rim, which is, uh, you know, uh, unique, I think, um, for the, around here anyway, um, about 70 to 120 microns across. Um, all the measurements which I made incidentally, um, they're not very exact. Uh, my methods have improved a lot since, um, <clears throat> but uh, they're, they're usually made when the uh, lichens are dry, the sample is dry uh, to be, um, to make life simple. Um, so they're usually ascending, we mean they're rising up on one side. Um, they usually have this very um, sharp depression. Um, they're flattened towards the rim. So it does actually make them a lot like ears in some places. And the common name is um, elfids. They're, they're pretty common lichens throughout Britain, I think. <clears throat> um, or like the inside of oyster shells, I've also uh, found people saying. Um, you do get a very light, not so noticeable here, I think perhaps a little bit there and definitely there, you get these concentric growth lines on the laminal surface, which is the, the, the actual surface of the thing away from the margin. Um, they usually attach quite firmly to the bryophytes underneath um, and ascending on the other side. Um, we, I haven't got a picture here, but um, I will tell you that they have a white felted underside. <clears throat> Um, which I think indicates that they don't have a lower cortex or a lower side of surface. <clears throat> and it's just literally the inside of, appears to be the inside of the, the, uh, the actual lobe, um, <clears throat> which is directly uh, in contact with the outside. Um, going to the next one, there's a couple more pictures. One of the things that you notice is these things, which are the soridia. 
Um, these are granules of um, mixed um, algae and fungal hyphae, <clears throat> which uh, is a manner in which these uh, lichens uh, reproduce themselves like many others, um, <clears throat> uh, rather than sexually through spores and things like that. So the idea is, is that these are either uh, moved around by the wind or whatever and um, start new colonies elsewhere or might even be eaten by things and start a new colony elsewhere. I'm not sure about the ceridium being, being moved around like that, but anyway, that's uh, <coughs> um, a ceridia. These ones are about 75 microns across. <coughs> and you can see that there's here, because it's a fresh sample, and people don't often photograph these, I think. Um, it's actually got uh, uh, quite noticeably, mine often had uh, the, this algal scum growing on it that really picks out the, the rim quite nicely, grows on the inside of the rim. <coughs> So I made a little note here um, that um, <clears throat> about uh, uh, squamules, which is what these are often called very small, in a sense, leaf-like, um, or uh, like a, a very tiny folio's lobe. <clears throat> and in fact, um, people like Mark Powell in his new glossary um, find it difficult to distinguish really when you would describe something as being uh, folios or squamulose. And uh, because the, and one of the old distinctions was to say it had a, a, a folio as like and would have a cortex underneath, but I think um, some people don't actually uh, call them that and call it that anymore, so that it could be uh, confused with being a folio as like and <coughs> to a squamulose one. Anyway, all the, the books um, would call it squamulose, I think, when you're looking in ID keys and so forth, as we'll see later on. <clears throat> That's what they look like when they're dry <clears throat> and uh, definitely much bluer green. The colors are not entirely reliable on screens and cameras and so forth, but definitely much bluer green and pretty much the same size as the, <clears throat> the wet fungus, a uh, wet lichen rather. So I use Dobson to identify it, not tremendously necessary because you can just look through the pictures and you will find Normandina Polchella and um, there's not much else to, to confuse it with. So it's squamulose <clears throat> in Dobson's uh, lichen book, which is you know, the key guidebook. Um, you go to key C and it uh, says squamulose with septate spores. So this is a slight uh, thing which is not so great in Dobson here because of course you have to know, you have to see the spores <laughs> and to look at them in the microscope to understand that they're septate or not. So you have to at this stage go through the pictures. It's a musciculus um, lichen growing on bryophytes. <clears throat> it has green uh, oyster shell shaped with slightly raised, with, with raised slightly paler, sometimes seredient margins. And it's two, three millimeters across. Uh, as I said, sometimes, especially with the more mature ones, they're actually quite big, a lot bigger than that. Um, next, uh, I had a look at the um, key in lichens of Great Britain and Ireland, the big red book, as I call it. Um, second edition which is now in the process of being revised to the third and in there the generic key would go thallus scale like <clears throat> um, which is what it is uh, thallus squamulose so you have to know what squamulose is and agree with that <clears throat> and then you go to the generic key and it's really saying it's not bright yellow not bright yellow green not orange red <clears throat> to find thallus squamulose sometimes minutely so and then key to be will say not pale green gray, um, not with more or less rounded scramules with a white margin when young. <clears throat> and then you get to um, two, which um, will give you um, uh, the correct uh, uh, lichen, which turns out to be Normandina pulcella. I can't quite read what I've written here because I've got the pictures in the front. I'll just move this. <clears throat> And in brackets, it has Lorda Linsaya Boreri, Tal J.C. David, and D. Hawkes, 1989. And the reason it has that is because it was originally described correctly in the distant past by Bora and Nylander as being, I'll just have to move this again, as uh, a lichen which had spore producing bodies with an apical pore, uh, which are called perithecia. So it was classed in those days as uh, an Ascomycete pyrenocarpus, meaning perithecia 
caring lichen, <clears throat> which is a term which is sometimes still used. <clears throat> But um, later on, um, because uh, seeing that the Perithecia are quite rare, <clears throat> um, people looked at the material they had and they had the non-fertile material. So they thought, aha, this is uh, Normandina porcella is actually a basidiomycete, you know, um, lichen, which is the other main group of lichen forming uh, fungi. <clears throat> and what, uh, what was, on it, the, the fruiting bodies must be a completely separate like chemicalus uh, fung fungus growing on it. And they gave it um, this name, Lodolinsia boreri. <clears throat> and that meant the rest of it, as I said, of, of, of Normandina pulcella was then said to be an infertile uh, Besidiomycete lichen. That was uh, dis discussed, <laughs> argued about, and eventually decided to be incorrect. So this classification change was undone, and there was some DNA work done, I think, at one stage to confirm it. On one sample, I have to add, as far as I can see, <clears throat> the current um, usage of perithecium is worth going into, because if you're not familiar with this, I mean, this, <clears throat> there's basically two terms. One is as, as, um, apothecium, and the other one is perithecium. Now, according to Mark Powell, <clears throat> these terms are pretty um, similar. The apothecium is the open cup-like version, which you get on, say, Xanthoria paratina, uh, you know, the very common um, yellow lichen. A perithecium is an enclosed one, um, as in uh, the ones in this case. Um, and, but they both contain um, ASCII and spores, and they're the fruiting bodies, the sexual reproduction um, scheme of lichens and fungi. <clears throat> um, so on to the next. Uh, so there is, uh, so one day I was having a look at here and I was surprised to find this, which is the uh, Normandina porcella um, <clears throat> with loads and loads of black dots on it. <clears throat> and um, nothing quite like it on any of the other uh, colonies of Normandina pulcella. And it turns out that this was uh, probably the fruiting body. And what was interesting as well about it, if you can see is the, <clears throat> the, the moss um, which had grown on is turned into this really slimy, gooey uh, mess. Uh, the uh, each uh, lobe or scramule here is um, basically they change shape. They become more complicated. Um, the uh, the conical features, about nine microns across, <clears throat> have this small um, opening at the top. Um, sometimes quite a few of them, <clears throat> uh, mostly in the middle, but not necessarily always of the each lobe, and. Um, the, the moss itself uh, seems to have completely turned into the sort of gelatinous, slimy, don't quite know how to describe it, um, gluey stuff. <clears throat> so under, I took a sample back of this and under the dissecting scope, um, as I said, I found these were much larger and more mature and sometimes more than four millimeters across. They have this interrupted wavy margin um, they're more flattened. They don't. They're not um, ascending as the way the young ones are, <clears throat> and they often have this fairly downturned margin at the side. Um, so there's another picture. There's one growing right on the side there. For uh, whereas most of them are obviously more central. Um, there's a detail of one. You can just about see the little. Well, most of mine seem to be quite quite closed. Um, there's a dry sample. You can see it looks fairly similar. Um, now here's a, a sample which was wet and you can see from the side, the uh, perithecium <coughs> is um, a white sphere, white slightly fluffy sphere. And when you look in about 400 microns, uh, my measurement's quite loose here. So I wouldn't uh, take them entirely as being uh, uh, that accurate. Um, Inside, uh, cutting one open, you can see there's this uh, pearly jelly. There's a black uh, layer, which is the uh, uh, a black, fairly stiff, like plastic material 
um, not friable. So that's why I wouldn't call it, one of the words which you use sometimes for these things is carbonaceous. This one isn't carbonaceous because it's not friable. It's not like um, charcoal <clears throat> or one of the other uh, things that uh, uh, carbonaceous is supposed to be. And it's got a white fluffy extension um, probably of the medulla uh, going all the way around it. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Um, so I wasn't able to take it, I didn't have the method to take a very good section uh, of it, but looking inside um, uh, and squashing in water uh, some of the jelly, um, uh, there was quite a lot of um, spores. So now at last you can follow Dobson and say these are septate spores. And typically they've got seven septate, which are the dividers, <clears throat> and eight cells, essentially. Uh, they're slightly curved. Um, slightly sausage shaped. They call them ellipsoid fusiform. <clears throat> and uh, I've got some measurements there as well, which I took in water, which I think is the correct way of doing this. Um, there's another picture and you can see that they seem to hold together in places, <clears throat> though I couldn't see any sort of enclosing um, ascus um, holding them together from, from this photo. <coughs> Um, further on, I, I then um, got some better information on how to do this. And uh, so uh, this is a dried sample and you can see this, the jelly is actually turned to a fairly solid material, which makes it a lot easier to cut <laughs> to get a section through. Um, so that's what I did. And um, this was the first result of it, which is, um, uh, I was quite amazed. You actually get some, uh, a fairly good picture um, through a smartphone. <clears throat> and um, it's in tap water, you can start to see some quite a lot of detailed features. Um, at this stage, I had a look with, uh, to see if there's anything written about um, these um, parathesia. And uh, what I got was uh, an item by um, TDV Swanscow in 1963, um, who said uh, in his uh, paper that he wrote for the lichenologist, uh, quite a short thing, he did a series on these pyrinocarpus lichens, that this one, um, he found, uh, there was some confusion about um, uh, a different form of this particular lichen. He'd managed to find some of the fruiting bodies and described it very briefly in this paper and provided a picture that he'd, a sketch that he'd made, uh, a diagram. And um, it's uh, very similar to mine. His was in Ireland, where a lot of the uh, finds of the fruiting body seem to come from at a place called the Eagle's Nest in uh, Donegal, I think, um, or County Kerry, rather. <coughs> and he provides a picture of the uh, spores as well, which are pretty similar to mine, I think, um, in places, especially some of the older ones. Um, so going on to the next thing, um, the, uh, there's a, a more detailed picture and uh, I've annotated it uh, in the following picture. So you've got um, the, uh, the black surrounding material, which is called the exipal, um, the outside of the, uh, the fruiting body, essentially. Um, it doesn't have a feature called an involucrellum, which would be up here and it would be like a ring right at the top, a quite separate looking feature um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the top of the exipal. Um, it's got um, these uh, interesting features here, which are called periphysoids, um, which line the upper surface uh, around the osteol itself. The osteol is kind of widened out because um, um, in the on the slide normally of course is much much smaller than this it'd probably be just a very small opening if it's open at all most of the time um, other features you can see are the uh, C which is the um, hymenium um, <clears throat> or thecium I think we're, we're not quite sure which uh, uh, which term to use both seem to be used um, and uh, pretty much um, uh, one for the other, <clears throat> and you can start to see this. There was quite a lot of um, ASCII in there with the uh, spores inside them. And underneath, you've got this uh, layer which on which the um, 
the ASCII and the, the hymenium is, which is the uh, described as the subhymenium. <clears throat> Some of it is pulled away a little bit, so you can see here, but that's purely to do with my um, slide making, I think, more than anything else. Um, it is relatively separate, I think, uh, the jelly, as we saw earlier, from the actual enclosing exipal. <clears throat> so moving on to the next thing, uh, I took a few pictures of slides. Um, <clears throat> I measured them um, various ways. Um, they all seem to match fairly closely what other people have found, which is they've got a, especially the older ones, they have a slightly raised um, border around the each one of the cells or sort of constricted at the septum, I think is the way they would describe it. Um, so the next thing is, um, uh, Mark Stevens suggested uh, a method of uh, staining, which is uh, using ink and vinegar, quink, uh, bl uh, blue black quink and vinegar um, to flush it out, which I've done. This is not a perfect slide by any means, it, uh, but it looks quite spectacular, I think, but it's got lots of bubbles in it. So uh, I'm not sure if there's a way of avoiding that, but uh, um, you can see uh, quite clearly the, uh, again, the uh, <coughs> uh, periphysoids up here and the uh, sub um, hymenium layer and the hymenium itself with the ASCII, some of them still in there, um, the ASCII with the spores still inside them. Um, so moving on to some detail, this is one which came out of the, um, uh, which was squashed out. Uh, so you can see the ASCIS, <coughs> the ASCIS here with, um, which is enclosing there, you can see the tip, uh, the apex of the ASCIS there, and you can start to see in here the, uh, the actual spores. Um, I had a good look around. I, I would basically say there's eight in each one, but as you can see, it's pretty difficult to count um, individually in these ones. And that's some uh, spores which have actually started coming out of uh, their ascus. Um, that's more of a detail inside um, a, a, a perithesium of the um, uh, uh, of the hymenium, hymenium rather. Um, and the, the feature which is interesting here is, is that um, other uh, um, ascocarps of this sort um, have uh, things called paraphyses or paraphyses, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but these are sterile filaments which grow in between each one, um, not each one, well generally between the um, the ASCII and might sort of help compress them together uh, when they're shooting out the spores <clears throat> is one of the suggestions of what their function is. And there's a detail of the periphysoids around the lip of the osteol underneath pointing downwards essentially. So they look like um, interesting sort of hair-like structures. Um, next I took uh, for general reference, um, this is a picture, sort of a picture through uh, the uh, the actual lobules of, of the uh, the squamule of the lichen itself. So you can see the sort of trabuxia type algae inside and uh, lots of interesting little things going on there. I wondered if, uh, if that was uh, some sort of uh, algae or something on the surface or whatever. Um, not much to say on that one, but uh, uh, just for reference. So then um, that was it, I thought on that. But then I, I was able to go back and have another look at where this colony had been on the 1st of March, 2021, as I said, not that long ago. And what I found was is that uh, basically um, all um, that colony and the slime and uh, the bryophytes uh, had pretty well disappeared and just left kind of like the wood of the, uh, of the oak tree, a, a kind of residue. And a few small um, uh, examples uh, of Normandina portocalia actually growing on it. Um, and most of these were very small. And they look like they've just started um, to grow, um, <laughs> that they're new ones. <clears throat> and there's a uh, three shot. Some little bits of older material still seem to be, still seem to remain. Um, but most of them seem to be very small, very simple. Uh, simple rounds, very oppressed to the surface, 
um, with the raised rim. I mean, uh, these would definitely be, I think, described as uh, uh, squamules here. <clears throat> and there's a few more. And next thing uh, I looked at was uh, the distribution. I mean, it's actually pretty common. Um, in Wales, it just seems to be, you know, fairly solid. Also the west of England and Cornwall and so forth and uh, Wales. Um, then it's more patchy towards the east of the country, particularly. Um, uh, quite a lot of it in Scotland too. Um, now, globally, it's supposed to be cosmopolitan. That's just pretty well everywhere in the world, um, especially near coasts. Um, except the one place it's not found apparently is Antarctica. <clears throat> in Britain, <clears throat> um, it's been described as oceanic <clears throat> uh, or sometimes an old woodland species, um, pretty common in the West, but as uh, pollution perhaps has diminished, it's supposed to be spreading uh, eastwards. So I asked um, Janet Simkin uh, at BLS to uh, what records are, because I thought this is strange. It's sort of like it's common and it's rare at the same time, which is a very curious situation. Uh, <clears throat> some people like um, the Plant Life's uh, Guide to um, Lichens of Atlantic Woodlands, I think it's uh, part two, um, says uh, fruiting bodies are never found. And uh, some of the illustrations, uh, you know, they talk about the spores and so on and so forth. But actually, um, their pictures are almost always of the unfertile uh, lichen. There's a few pictures on the web, um, generally, of uh, fertile stuff. But you also see papers like uh, the first recorded instance in um, Kerala in India of uh, fruiting Normandina. So I don't know what's, what's going on there really. So looking at uh, the records that Janet Simkin sent me, there's only two in the BLS um, uh, database for England at all. And one is in North Devon um, collected by uh, Barbara Benfield in 2007. And there's another one in Wales, in Carnarvon, <clears throat> um, where I think, uh, looking around, so where quite a few of the pictures are from. So that's it for the whole of uh, Britain. So uh, the, my question is, is it um, just not being recorded as when it's in the fruiting form uh, specifically? Um, or is it just under recorded? Or is it actually genuinely rare? And that, uh, that, that's, so if you have any questions, that's pretty much um, uh, the end of my talk on this, as far as I know. Um, I'd obviously, uh, there's bits missing from my um, uh, notes. One is which was obviously to thank everybody who's really helped me with this, particularly my Zoom group, uh, and uh, uh, lots of the information, like uh, uh, things that people have told me about how to uh, section <clears throat> section of these things, particularly Paul Wellen and Mark Stevens and a lot of other people, John Brownbill and, and what have you. So um, that's something I'm going to add in the future. But um, uh, that's it, really. Any questions? <laughs> wow. Well, very good point. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. So, Great work. So, so I've got a, a question. Uh, Fred, um, could you just run through your um, your preparation of those beautiful slides and how did you manage to get your sections so thin? Well, this was uh, the, the great uh, revelation, which is, <clears throat> I think there's um, between Mark Powell and John Skinner who described this. Um, essentially, um, um, this was using gum Arabic and um, I stuck down the dried uh, lichen on the gum arabic and used um, the sort of normal technique with a razor blade to try and get a, a thin section out of that um uh that's about uh, the that seemed to work pretty well and then just to uh, do i think what everybody suggests just put it in water and um, then put it onto the slide or put it straight onto the slide the one thing i found with these is because the they're quite delicate um, I didn't use um, K because um, uh, a lot of people say to mount in K, but I th these were so delicate, I, I think it kind of damaged them a bit or changed the shape quite a lot. So water and then straight on with the uh, quink and um, vinegar uh, <clears throat> staining method if necessary. <clears throat> 
the quaint, sorry, just a technical thing. What microscope are you using for that? Um, this is a, a very venerable, um, it's uh, Lights SM Lux. Uh, it's got okay. some problems, <laughs> but uh, I've managed to attach it to my smartphone, <clears throat> and uh, which seems to give um, uh, pretty pretty good results. But right. it's got mm. some some features about, which is to do, which I'm trying working on, which a lot of it is to do with uh, the fact that you get compression artifacts with JPEGs. And also the lenses of the smartphones leads to um, distortions. In particular, there's uh, pin cushion distortions where the, the outside of the frame, if you're using a rectangular frame, <clears throat> gets pushed outward. So it looks like a pin cushion in the sense if you have a grid. And um, uh, yes, yes, that that's uh, th there's a number of issues I would say, but I mean, you know, up to if you one ha one accepts the limitations of it, I think the results can be quite good.